Well, why don't we jump right in then as people also come in. Uh, and uh, yeah, welcome to this more wide open uh, discussion around the federal budget, federal action 2021. What's the ask? There's many things happening now and we thought we wanted to bring us all together to have a, a countrywide discussion. So this meeting uh, is, is going to be a webinar, it's not going to be a webinar style um, as we've typically done in the past. It's going to be uh, uh, the opportunity for all of us to be on the screen. Uh, and so you can, uh, at, 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 at one point now after our presentation uh, at the front end of this, uh, this meeting. So please feel free to mute, mute yourselves, and, but then also uh, you can feel free to have your camera on or off. Um, and if you want to speak after, uh, after we've gone through some of the preliminary discussions with the panel, um, please raise your hand and we will um, we can then, uh, we'll call on you and you can unmute yourselves and contribute to the discussion. If you don't want to speak, please feel free to uh, put your thoughts in the chat box and uh, we can try to, uh, Kirsten's gonna be monitoring that, my colleague Kirsten Bermacki, and she's gonna help us uh, keep on top of that as well. So next slide, please. I wanna begin, we wanna begin this meeting by uh, acknowledging that this gathering uh, originates from the National Trust headquarters in Ottawa, and that is situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. The National Trust for Canada acknowledges and respects the ancestral lands of Indigenous peoples and their cultural and traditional relationships with the land. Next slide, please. So I also want to introduce our panelists, such as they are. This is a wide open uh, egalitarian meeting, but there are some core people that I wanted to acknowledge today. One is Gil Barrows, who's the principal of Vox Public Affairs, and he's our government relations guru that helps us uh, throughout the year. I also have with me uh, Robert Pajot, who's uh, the National Trust Regeneration Project Leader. Rob is gonna wave there. And I also have Kirsten Vormacki, who's also in the Regeneration Project uh, team. And she is going to be helping us out as well. And I'm Chris Weave, and I'm the manager of Heritage Policy and Government Relations at the National Trust. And it's going to be a very interesting discussion today. So next slide, please. So why are we having this conversation? Well, there's many different things happening now, including uh, the possibility of a federal election coming up uh, in the next uh, few months. But it's coming at a time when there's quite a bit COVID uh, precipitated, um, other, other, other challenges uh, precipitating it. Uh, there's been some, you know, in terms of, uh, discussions around anti-racism, around Indigenous cultural heritage and uh, those historic places. A lot of things are happening. There's a lot of things in flux. Um, and uh, this discussion around what do we, what is the ask at the federal level in Canada also feeds into a larger discussion that's happening um, at the uh, National Trust Conference, National Trust CAP Conference uh, later on in the fall. And there's going to be some build up to that in terms of a discussion paper looking at what is the heritage, what is the heritage reset? How do we reframe the heritage conservation uh, uh, values and, and, and movement to be truly relevant at this moment of flux uh, that, we're, that, we're, that we're seeing in terms of societally, culturally, economically, environmentally. Um, so that's part, of the, that's part of the equation. There's a lot of other things happening elsewhere as well, and we're going to be having uh, those people involved at the conference as well, like the National Trust for Historic Preservation. They've just launched a, national, a discussion around a national impact agenda in the U.S. around um, what, uh, how, does, how does heritage preservation, historic preservation there, um, situate itself? How does, it, how does it meet this moment in terms of uh, social, cultural, economic and you know, climate change expectations. So there's those discussions. I know that in Australia, the National Trust down there, the National Trusts um, are having a conversation around their climate action plans. And they've, they've, some of them have, have come out with them. Uh, and I know things are happening in England. And of course, with the Climate Heritage Network, um, which is uh, you know, uh, bringing together heritage groups from around the world, there's a whole um, discussion that's building towards COP26, which is happening in, uh, in, in, in Scotland in the fall. 
uh, around what, what the, the role that heritage plays in climate change uh, and in terms of in its mitigation and adaptation to it. Um, so there's so many things happening. It's, it's, it's a really kind of a, a time pregnant with possibilities. Uh, and so um, this kind of smaller uh, discussion around where, where Canada's, um, where the, the federal the heritage conservation sectors ask to the federal government is embedded within those kind of larger, uh, larger considerations. So next, uh, next slide, please. So what have we asked in the past, just to back up and like refresh our memories about what we've asked <laughs> and how we framed things in the past. Um, just wanted to bring up the questions that we asked candidates for in the, uh, the, the past federal election, 2019. Um, we're thinking there might be one uh, announced soon and it'll probably happen in August, but we'll ask Gil about his crystal ball on that and what that implications will, of that will be. But um, we, we broke, in the past, we've broken it down into kind of those four pillars uh, of, of areas of interest. One is, you know, the economic side of things, uh, given that um, the federal government has a, 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 a substantial role to play in framing the system around where uh, heritage places, be they land, be they uh, properties and, and buildings, um, are considered. We've looked at, you know, the tax system has been a, has, has been a big focus for the heritage movement over the years, and we reflected that in the first bullet there. Then, of course, Indigenous peoples and their and their kind of um, capacity uh, and uh, support for their work to um, recognize and and uh, and uh, sustain heritage places that are of importance to them. That's always been on the agenda as well. So we asked that question, um, and it's very relevant now as well, of course. Then there's also the, the historic the, the Canada's federal house and order question around. Um, how the federal government handles and protects and uh, uses its heritage resources as um, as inspiration for Canadians uh, and as uh, handles it in a way that also kind of inspires action uh, throughout Canadian society. So that was another question there, and also the of course the economic development side, looking at um, you know the the rural um, and traditional small towns, trying to broaden out the discussion around. And relevance around heritage places to uh, some of those uh, some of those uh, other uh, other locations around the country. So next slide. Maybe I'll jump in. Uh, actually, Chris, so I'll just jump in. Uh, just a reminder that in, in 2019, um, like what we've done at the National Trust for a number of, of, of past elections, we did a lot of consultations within the sector. Um, and these questions um, that are on the screen uh, that were on the screen. Um, that are on the screen now, um, came from a position paper that we developed jointly with the National Council members across the country. And, it, and they do reflect very much what was happening at the time in 2019. I think most many of you will remember that there was a, a private members bill in, in the House of Commons that although it got kind of squashed, it did lead to the House of Commons Environment Committee, the ENVY report that many of you will remember, uh, Preserving Canada's Heritage, a Foundation for Tomorrow, which was a really important document that the House of Commons came out with, um, calling on a, no had a number of great points in it, um, including the federal legislation piece um, and another components that in fact were reflected in these electoral positions and these questions that we put forward. So the, the questions that, you, that you're seeing on your screen um, came from a number of factors um, and a position paper that had been sent ahead of time to the national parties, the National Trust in collaboration with the, the National Council members. We sent a position paper ahead of time to inform the national parties on their platforms. And then in the course of the election, we then sent to the national parties these four questions that we asked all the parties to respond to. And these questions also, um, we, we were encouraging our people across the country to, uh, um, to use these as the basis of questions for your local candidates. So a little bit more context on those questions and how we have, how we at the, the Trust have, not, uh, have been framing um, our role in, in, in past elections. So maybe Emily, you can move back forward uh, to more recently, just last year, maybe I'll just keep going here, Chris. Um, we, um, Many of you participated last summer in the context of, of the pandemic, our shovel ready, a whole shovel ready initiative that we, we led with the National Council members and all of you last summer to identify an actual number uh, that we could put before the, um, 
the Finance Committee in the pre-budget consultations that are actually happening traditionally right at this time of year is when the pre-budget consultations are usually taking place. So collectively, we worked last year together to put this in front of the Finance Committee, that $200 million ask um, that is more detailed here on the, on the screen, as well as, again, hammering down the point of the, the federal government uh, in response to the TRC recommendations, really does need to provide systematic and structural support for leadership in the Indigenous heritage um, sector. So that was last year around this time. Um, and so maybe next slide, um, Emily. Um, what happened, in fact, and, and maybe I'll bring in Kirsten here, um, a lot of our, our, our consultations went, led to what was in the budget to 2021. So maybe just as a quick reminder, uh, maybe Kirsten, do you want us to walk us through what was just announced just a few months ago um, in budget 2021? Well, it, it's important, I think, to note that sort of building on what Rob just said about um, Indigenous leadership and federally funded Indigenous leadership, that that was one of the larger pieces that was missing from budget 2021. Um, we also unfortunately were missing that long awaited tax incentive that the heritage industry has been uh, hoping for for a while now and that had been recommended in the finance committee pre budget recommendation so that was a very unfortunate miss for the industry, um, having disregarded the recommendations of the finance committee, but um, within the budget, despite the fact that the budget was a bit of a different budget for 2021. The government was definitely focusing on rebuilding, on rejuvenating the economy. So it, there was a little bit of a different mood surrounding the budget. It was definitely a little bit more post COVID focused, but we did manage to have a few wins. Um, within that was this 2.6 billion for energy audits and small retrofit grants. Now that's going through home audits. So million 4.4 billion through CMHC over five years also for some deep home retrofits through interest-free loans so a deep this is they're calling this yeah the, the deep home retrofit could also signal some difficulties within the heritage sector and it sort of behooves us to make sure we're keeping an eye on what sort of signals are being made about these deep home retrofits and the fact that you know if if these retrofits are too destructive and too deep, then we're actually really working against the idea of climate change and green energy. And we want to make sure that our heritage properties aren't being misused through these deep home retrofits. Um, this 460 million for Indigenous heritage, uh, it might look like a lot, but it does not provide funding for this federal level heritage leadership that we've been asking for and that we asked for in the pre-budget consultations. And it covers 460 million over five years to support language reclamation and revitalization, indigenous cultural spaces, sport programming for indigenous women and girls, and events to commemorate the legacy of residential schools and preserve indigenous heritage. So once you sort of look at that whole spectrum of funding for the Indigenous heritage area, it really doesn't leave a lot of room for what we had been asking for was this higher level federal heritage Indigenous group. So 31 million of additional funding is over two years to support the co-development of an action plan for UNDRIP. So that will be moving ahead now, now that UNDRIP has passed as well but it's unclear how much of that 31 million will go towards actual indigenous leadership and how much of it obviously sort of gets eaten up in terms of the bureaucracy of creating this action plan. So that was a bit of a loss. Um, we move on to this 200 million through the Canadian Heritage Fund for Arts and Culture. This covers a lot of the more sort of soft arts. So we're dealing with local festivals, community cultural events, outdoor theater performances, heritage celebrations, local museums, and more. So again, another, what looks like a larger group of money, but it's covering a lot of small organizations and a, not necessarily going to bricks and mortar. And even some large organizations as well, large cultural organizations. So when it's spread, spread out, it's quite thin. Exactly, spread out pretty thin. Now this 500 million 
we have going to the community places. So Main Streets luckily was sort of part of this 500 million, but it also went to places like farmers markets and town squares and sort of being referred to as sort of gathering places that will stimulate local economy specifically in smaller communities. So again, it's not necessarily earmarked for projects like Main Street revitalization in a deeper and more intense way that we might be looking for, um, especially post COVID. And then speaking of this report, the Preserving Canada's Heritage, the Foundation for Tomorrow, uh, the link which I put in the chat here, there is 2.28.7 million over five years to Parks Canada for the ongoing implementation that if legislation is implemented, it would provide transparent designation framework as well as a sustainable protection of over 300 federally owned historic places. So there is no legislation yet. So this money is earmarked, hoping for a legislation movement in terms of the protection of the federally owned historic places, but without an actual legislation, this money is not going towards any actual action. And sort of as a last bullet, this is something that if you think a little bit creatively, the 1.5 billion in rapid housing initiative could potentially be directed at heritage properties. There's also 600 million over seven years to renew and expand the Affordable Housing Innovation Fund, which is encouraging new funding models and innovative building techniques in the affordable housing sector, which should and could involve adaptive reuse of heritage buildings. Um, it makes sense if we're trying to do this rapidly to use building stock that already exists, but it should also be noted that there hasn't been a lot of information of how these funds are necessarily being tracked, how are we tracking success rates, um, and exactly how budget 2021 will will move forward. So that's just Thanks, sort of a quick overview. Thanks, Kirsten. And maybe Emily, we can stop sharing the screen now so we can see everybody on the screen. Um, and just a note, uh, the budget 2021, uh, with the screen that we just showed, um, is part uh well i mean we a lot of that is it's fairly recent some of that money is in fact maybe not new money some of that may be from existing programs and some of them have not yet even rolled out um some of them have we know that for example the healthy communities fund is being rolled out and monies are, are getting distributed so um so yeah it's 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 not a always a an easy thing to track the progress on on that budget 21 but maybe what we'll, we'll do right now is uh, we'll turn it over to gil uh gil barrows because we, we, we want to frame the discussion a little bit because you traditionally at this time of year, we would be in pre-budget consultations and collectively we would be talking about our asks. But I think it's no secret. I think all of you are seeing the prime minister flying across the country making announcements right now and the other leaders. There will almost certainly, everybody here in Ottawa knows that there's going to be an election called in the next few weeks. Um, and so we thought we should bring in our, our brain power on, on a lot of this and work is Gil Barrows to help us talk and think about our strategy as a sector. Um, so uh, Chris, did you want to ask specific questions of Gil or, or, or Gil, um, I think you know, you know us very well and you know where we are in our, in our process. Maybe you can talk about uh, what you're hearing and uh, advice for our strategies. Yeah, thanks a lot, Robert. Um, Three things, just I'll talk about the election speculation, which you no, no doubt have heard. I'll talk about uh, how a campaign is likely to unfold, although that's a pretty hard thing to predict because politics never un unfolds the way it, uh, it's uh, planned. And then I'll talk about what it means for the heritage sector. Uh, number one, the speculation is that the Prime Minister will go to the Governor General August 14th or 15th, and the Liberals want a short campaign, and the shortest they can have is 36 days. That's the law. So that would put the uh, election about uh, September 20th. Uh, that's speculation. Uh, I think pretty firm speculation. That's the plan right now. What we uh, do know that's not speculation is what the Liberals are actually doing. A couple of weeks ago, they uh, invoked a clause in the Liberal Party constitution that allowed them to speed up the nomination of, of candidates at the writing level. The uh, Liberal staffers 
had been told to take their holidays in July, now, so that they're prepared for August. And uh, the liberals that are in ministers' offices who will be working on the campaign need to leave, formally leave the liberal, the, uh, liberal ministers' offices. So they'll be, they're told to get out, uh, out of the ministers' offices and, and into the campaign headquarters by the end of this month. So coming up very quickly. Uh, the, the other thing that's, uh, there's a few other things that are feeding into the election speculation. And uh, just saying that, you know, everyone in all parties, maybe with the exception of the Green Party, they're all operating on the assumption there is going to be an election. So it, effectively, even if there isn't an election for some reason, we're into a pre-election period where everyone's thinking in terms of their platforms and how they ought to position. Uh, if you look at the polls, the liberals have been around, if you look at the average of polls, uh, there's a firm called, for instance, uh, 338 Canada, and they aggregate the polls and they, they say the liberals are at uh, around 36% and climbing. That's short of maj a majority. You need 38 to 40% to, uh, to have a, a majority. Uh, the conservatives seem to be stuck at around, uh, just looking up here, 28 to 30%. The NDP are stuck at around 19%. And in Quebec, uh, the Liberals are leading the Bloc 37 to 32. This is all interesting stuff, but it, it doesn't tell you how many seats we're going to win. So a party needs to, it isn't how many votes you get, you, get a, you got to win the seats to form the majority. Uh, some interesting research out of a a group called the Innovative Research Group did a, a much larger sample that allows them to get more granular about what's actually happening at the... Uh... Oops. Sorry, I got muted somehow. Maybe I'm talking too much, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, uh, Innovative Research Group Took a more granular look at the uh, the samples with uh, you know far more people surveyed, and what they found was that the uh, liberals in the seats where they've been strong in the past remain strong, and in the seats that swing they're gaining ground, whereas the conservatives in the their, their base vote is remaining strong, but in the swing seats they in fact are are, are weakening. And that's the same for the NDP. They, are in fact, have weakened a bit in some of the swing seats. So according to Innovative Research Group, the Liberals are in a, uh, a pretty comfortable majority position. Now, I suspect that the Liberals themselves have internal polling that's telling them the same thing. So that, that is just a, a huge pressure to go now, and particularly to go now <clears throat> when we assume that the, uh, the public's in a better mood and you know the pandemic is easing and uh, life is getting better. Better to go now than to wait uh, you know, a year when the, the bills start to pour in for, we, I mean, the government is just at unprecedented levels of spending. And at some point the bills have to be paid. So better to go now when people are in a a better mood than to wait until the uh, the reality of the financial markets kicks in. <clears throat> now, the uh, <clears throat> how as to how the campaign, <clears throat> excuse me, might unfold, and I say might unfold because everyone's got a a bold plan, and it, it's like uh, going to war. You know, the battle plan can fall apart in the first ten minutes. But the Liberals want to be to have a, a low bridge approach, very low key, shortest election possible, and uh, they want to re uh, to release their platform late in the campaign, not before before the campaign. The Conservatives, uh, well, just to talk about what the Liberals' theme might be. I think all you have to do is look back at the last throne speech and the last budget. And I think you, you 
we've got most of it right there. And, uh, you know, for the heritage sector, that means uh, the things you can link into most easily are jobs. Everybody wants jobs. In fact, all the three major parties have promised a million jobs uh, and the environment. And I think now it, indigenous issues are, you know, going to be front and center. There's just, uh, there's no way to avoid the discussion anymore. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a, something in my throat. Gil, do you think, just quickly jumping in here, in terms of the party platforms, are these things, are they baked already? Are they done? Or, or do we have an opportunity to influence those, uh, those, those, those documents, those ideas? Yeah, good question. Uh, they're drafted, probably with the exception of the Green Party because they're having internal problems, but uh, they're drafted. They're, they're definitely not baked. You know, uh, what I think the liberal strategy is, is to release, re release it late in the campaign. And I suspect that, you know, that takes some pressure off the Conservatives and the NDP to, to put their platforms out early. So they're, they're, you know, it gives them an opportunity to test the wind and see uh, what the themes, what's working and what's not working. But <clears throat> the bottom line is you're not too late. <clears throat> you should get a move on if you want to put something in to the, the party platform people, the drafters, but you're not too late. <laughs> is that is really? something that, as I mentioned earlier, is something that we have done as a sector, put out our, a, a position paper. Yeah. So um, so those half-baked platforms, as Gil said, we'll quote you, Gil, that you say that they're half-baked, um, <laughs> but uh, that, that there is an opportunity for us. Um, you know, we still have a few weeks as, we are, as we're hearing, at least until maybe perhaps a month, um, until the actual election is called three to four weeks uh, to create a position paper. So... Very interesting. And maybe yeah. you could speak just briefly to that, Gil, before we want to dive into some of the conversation, uh, get some dialogue with uh, our assembled uh, participants here. I mean, and can you speak just really briefly to the idea of having a, the importance of having a consistent message and, 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 and a united kind of alignment uh, in terms of getting through the, at the political level? It's, it's absolutely critical. You need to have a clear, consistent and constant message across the country. If, if the message is muddled, no one's gonna pay attention to it and it will certainly not get into the party platform. <laughs> so you need messages that hopefully you can tailor to the positions of the parties. So jobs, number one, jobs. It's the first thing that everyone was talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the environment, and indigenous issues. So if you can tailor your messages to those three themes, and I can't tell you what your messages ought to be. You guys have got to figure that out yourself. But if they're not clear, consistent and constant, they'll just be, they'll just fly away in the wind. Uh, did I answer your question, Chris? No, that's great. And I think what we should maybe do now, that's good, Gil, I will hold you and you can jump in at various points, um, I'm sure, uh, in the conversation ahead. But maybe we should dive into some of the questions. And I don't know whether people have raised their hands. Um, we had put up some draft election questions, and I don't know if we need to go back to those now, but basically it's following some of the 2019 ideas around, you know, hitting climate change notes, talking about Indigenous cultural heritage being another you know, the federal leadership and, and, and then getting its house in order kind of idea. And also that idea of showing the, you know, connecting heritage with jobs and, uh, and uh, the new creation of new, the new green job of tomorrow. Um, those kind of four areas. Are there other, I mean, are, do people have thoughts there? I don't know, Don, you're sticking up your thumb there. Yeah. Off, uh, Don, off in Vancouver. Do you want to jump in with your thoughts? Uh, sure, let's start in the West and work East. Um, hi everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, this is great and very timely, but we've been here before. So what I, um, our, our last round of letters that went to the last finance minister, Bill Morneau, received an insulting response. So first of all, we have to test the wind to see if there's a change in attitude. 
But number two, who's our champion? Because we lost Robert Aldeg. And so my feeling is it's not a position paper yawn. It's a call to action with big screaming red letters that really ties heritage conservation, first of all, to jobs, I agree. Um, uh, the indigenous issue is obvious and climate change is obvious, but the jobs are gonna come from the tax credits. And so we need some demonstration of that, but I'd really like to see it framed, having written letters of the last almost 40 years about this. Um, I would like to see it be really more proactional and to, to really say, this is the time to pass the Historic Places Act, to get your house in order, to finally send out a message uh, about the importance of Canada's cultural heritage, period. And I, I, what, I, what I think we need to do is instead of it, sending out individual letters they can ignore, it should be one great big huge petition or letter uh, that really says everybody supports this. So pick the four things we support and just everybody support it, period. One sheet. Yeah. No, I think that I think that that does that does make a lot of sense. I mean, it's easy to fall into that uh, that kind of more kind of bureaucratic approach where you're creating the position papers, which is yeah, it could be a yawner. I think we need to get our we need to find alignment on what we want to go with, and um, and really really make the case. I mean, there's so much in flux right now. Now is a golden moment to assert. Uh, the heritage uh, role in all of those areas in terms of the climate action, indigenous cultural heritage, you know, the, new, the, the, the new jobs, the new good jobs of tomorrow uh, and, uh, and uh, some of the other, other things too. Dino, are you I not here? Sure. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. No, I was going to say, Dino, I just see you appearing. Dino, you want to talk about it, Dino? Oh, oh, oh. Parler au lieu de l'écrire, euh, ça m'évitera d'avoir à l'écrire en anglais. Uh, merci uh, de l'invitation. Merci, Jill, for your uh, enlightening and uh, Kirsten and, and Robert and Chris for the invitation. Pourrais-tu parler un peu plus fort, Dino? On a un peu de misère à t'entendre. C'est ça quand on est loin, tu sais. Mais Vancouver, moi, je viens de Vancouver. Hein, on, a, on a dû quitter parce qu'on avait, c'était pas facile de parler français là-bas, là, mais quand même. <laughs> Alors, uh, écoutez, uh, I'd like to, uh, we had a discussion at Heritage Montreal yesterday about this topic. And uh, one of the thing you may, uh, you know, uh, who just mentioned about being more, uh, less bureaucratic and more punchy, I think it's, uh, it's a valid point. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, hysterical or crazy or unthoughtful, but, uh, you know, there's a moment where we have to not work to insinuate ourselves in, what is essentially uh, uh, completely watertight systems. I don't think the part, uh, Parti Politique Federal will even care unless there is an issue. Right now, the heritage issue is uh, church burning in the West, and that's uh, not something they're going to touch anyway. So, uh, you know, what is the, you know, the South African, when they faced a very, very strong tension moment of revelation and need to reconciliate, they didn't burn Robben Island, they put it on the World Heritage List of UNESCO. And that's something perhaps we could collectively uh, think about, but I don't see the leadership currently in the political party. One thing that may be uh, useful to reflect on is the role of metropolitan areas. You know, provinces are good. Uh, the country is interesting, but what about, you know, where, you know, in Montreal, we have the prime minister plus three ministers. You know, is, some, is there something we can do to challenge them as candidate now? Uh, what is happening in Toronto, in Halifax, in uh, Vancouver, in Calgary? What is uh, the base to pass the message maybe? Because this is the place where often you have media where we can discuss heritage issues because they are tangible to the general public. They can, you know, in Montreal, we can associate this with Mount Royal, which was uh, refused by Parks Canada in a very contemptful fashion. Uh, I'm sure in, in Halifax, they can deal with the, the federal government property and the, 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 some of the, the sites there. I'm, I'm sure we can go across and imagine what could be a role for metropolitan area in the discussion. And uh, I would perhaps imagine the idea of uh, federal properties being a topic. They have asset that in order to pay for the, the bill, which 
Jill reminded us is going to come. Maybe there's going to be a second wave of uh, uh, disposition of assets and so on. And we know many of these assets are, are significant in the community and they don't come with, uh, with funding to repurpose them properly. So calling for the, the, the future of property, federal property might be something we can call it become tangible. Uh, another thing is uh, what are the uh, unavoidable rendezvous for the next government? You know, since we, we don't know when the next election will be, maybe it's going to be a minority government, maybe not. But what in the next two or three years is something we would like a hair to be an unavoidable rendezvous on the agenda of any government in Canada? And I don't have an answer for that, but I suggest this might be something to think about. And it could be, uh, I don't know if the, G, uh, the G7 is coming to Canada. I don't know if there is the COP coming to Canada again. I have no idea, but maybe it's something we can uh, look around. You know, Habitat Conference was an opportunity in the past. Anyway, some, some ideas uh, off the cuff. Uh, surely in, in, in the case of Heritage Montreal, we're, we have a habit of uh, publishing public letter, which are not something uh, uh, partisan you know they have we have we are an independent sector but what we put in the media is a question that will have to be answered by any government whichever the party is and it's a government is not just the party it's also the house huh? so uh, thank you yes you know did you want to dive in on that idea of like uh, uh, applying um getting attention via the the the, the metropolitan level do, do, you, do you want to say any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, I might go back first to what Donald said about keeping the message very sharp, not writing great long briefing notes, but doing, a, you know, if you can do it on a page, great. Uh, as far as uh, Dinu's comments, <clears throat> I think you use whatever leverage you've got. And if, you, you've, if you've got <coughs> the prime minister, and ministers, I say, use it, uh, absolutely. And uh, if you're in a rural area, you still will have leverage, but in a metropolitan area, <coughs> Toronto, Vancouver, or uh, Montreal, wherever, you're, you're going to have some leverage and uh, you should definitely use it, I agree. As for linking to international events, uh, it's an interesting idea and I haven't really thought that through and I don't know what's coming to Canada but over you're, you're right you know over time there will be some events that are going to happen in international events that will happen in Canada and maybe maybe you can link to it and it's a great way to get into the press and on the urban agenda Gil uh, the, the partnership uh, should we be seeking partnerships there are other players like the Canadian Urban Institute that have a lot of connections and have a real a role in representing the, the urban voice of Canada, along with the C, uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, et cetera, partnering with them, or is there a strategy that we as a sector should be using to amplify either what they're saying or collaborating in some, some of the messaging? I, I'd say you need to get your message first before you consider collaborating. And then if your message fits with somebody else, absolutely cooperate, leverage, do, you know, do them a favor, do yourselves a favor, but the message, the objective and the messages are the key thing. If it becomes muddled, then nobody wins. Oh, I want to I jump in here too. I'm just seeing Mark uh, Brandt uh, has put some um, strong things in strong pointed ideas in the chat around climate action. I don't know whether Mark's available or able to unmute and just speak to a few of those because he's very involved with Climate Heritage Network, Zero Net Carbon Collab Collaboration and others um, in terms of that whole international discussion. Mark, do you want to just speak to some of your comments there in the chat? Sure, Chris. Sure. Um, I think it's really important uh, along the lines of uh, what Donald and Gil have been saying um, for a clear message and We've been honing it in some of those organizations you just mentioned that I've been working with um, down to um, a, a short phrase that's building reuse is climate action. And it's a phrase that seems to be picking up across the continent in all of these different um, 
building decarbonization groups and embodied carbon groups. And that's where Heritage comes in, that we, we will get in the door by uh, showing how embodied carbon is becoming more and more of, um, of a concern uh, in order for us to reach Paris Agreement um, uh, emissions targets. Um, and so existing in historic buildings, therefore, become more and more of a, of a player, if you will. Um, just the fact that 80% of all of the buildings in 2050 are those that are standing today. And the other fact that 40% of all carbon emissions is to do with um, materials in buildings and the operations of buildings. So uh, it seems to me that there's a very powerful message already there and that it needs to be crafted in a clear and concise way. One option is building reuse is climate action or something along those lines. But for the policymakers or voters, which are two very different groups, but nevertheless, we need to speak to both. Um, it, they need to understand that, you know, things like electric cars are great, but that's not where the majority of our emissions reductions is gonna come from. The majority is gonna come from all our existing buildings, which includes historic buildings. So we really wanna push that. And notwithstanding um, the good point that Kirsten made about um, having to be careful about deep green rehabilitations, that's something that our tighter sector, the, the conservation community can focus on after the opportunity becomes available. We can then get the message out about the care you need to take, the extra level of consideration that needs to go into deep green in historic buildings as opposed to run-of-the-mill warehouses or, or other secondary ex existing buildings. And then thirdly, I guess, um, Gil mentioned jobs and how universally important that is in pretty much any Canadian election. Um, and the, 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 the fact of the matter is um, by by either legislating a requirement to decarbonize buildings, which may be controversial, or um, providing training for um, the um, intelligent and skilled decarbonization of buildings, including historic buildings, will automatically mean jobs will be had. Um, and so, you know, when you think of um, the, any work on a, on a historic building, but including deep green rehabilitation, um, that is, a, you know, a high labor intensive activity. So it's going to attract these new green jobs that we're talking about. So, um, you know, green technologies is one thing, and that's a great area that we can retrain fossil fuels based jobs into green technology jobs. But skilled um, skilled labor, skilled um, craftsmen, uh, skilled uh, technologists in the deep green rehab of uh, heritage buildings are very important. So how you get that message down to something clear and concise, I think is something that we need to look at. That's really great, Mark. And I think you're right, absolutely, about changing the vision and not just through like changing the skill sets of some of the people working in the industry, but in terms of changing the appetites of consumers and the people that use the buildings and demand change in buildings. I think there's a whole uh, side of, of uh, around the obsolesce, premature obsolescence of interiors and others unnecessary re renovation that I think the heritage community can really provide strong insight. Don't go deep, go to what you need to get to to get the biggest bang for your buck uh, in terms of uh, carbon uh, and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think it's totally yeah, I think you're going to have two sets of messages, right? One for the election, and then one after the election, after we get everything we ask for, uh, then we'll have to hone in the next set of messages um, along the lines of what you just said, Chris. I think there's some others that wanted to jump in. I don't know. I see Mark Donne there, or um, there's a few others we could go to. I guess Jane. Uh, is, is asking about affordable housing. Mark, did you have, did you have something to throw into the mix? 
Well, as you can see, I'm disguised as Hagit Hadaya. Um, I, let's just say that I had a few technical issues. Um, but I'll defer to you, Chris. Um, I've been working on this for a long time. Our first set of demands for economic support from the feds went out in 1974. So this is not a new issue. Um, having essentially missed most of this meeting, uh, where would you like me to jump in? Um, I don't know if you just had some high, high level thoughts in terms of some of the work that you've been doing. I guess actually in terms of your discussions that you had, I know you've been talking with Ontario MPPs, what is the, can you give us insights into the um, tenor of the times in terms of what they are receptive to, what they are interested in, in your discussions with them? Um, okay, the thing that has to be understood about Finance Canada is that they really don't care much about the opinion of MPPs or MPs. For that matter, they've rejected the opinions of two parliamentary committees in four years. So um, they know what this is about. It's not that Finance Canada is uninvolved or uninterested. It's that they are unconvinced. The issue here is extremely simple, and that is Finance Canada and Canada Revenue Agency picture themselves as the valiant and fearless defenders of the integrity of the tax system. If you have a greenfield construction project where the entrepreneur, the developer, is going out and building brand new, okay, there are some tax benefits involved, but they are not terribly significant. If you have, however, a, an entrepreneur who takes an old building and wants to make it competitive with a new building, then they go apoplectic. How could that possibly be assisted by the tax system? Because if you assist one group of people who are putting a product onto the market and you don't assist another, what is it about egregious unfairness that you don't understand? Okay, now that has been the position of Finance Canada for years and years and years. So people go forward and they say, well, it's in the public interest. Finance Canada deals with people arguing the public interest every day. They chew up 20 of them before breakfast and spit them out every morning. They are not interested in that. The only thing that is of interest to Finance Canada is the sore point, fairness. Okay, is the system unfair? You argue that point, it hits a nerve. Now, the good news is we can prove that the system is currently unfair. There are, at last count, at least 19 disincentives that are built into the Income Tax Act and the Excise Tax Act to discourage people from doing precisely what you want to do. Okay, they are there to encourage demolition overtly, and they are there to discourage reuse overtly. And how do we know this? Because in the 1940s, it got written into the public record. It got written into the public record, to use the, the phrase used by none other than Mackenzie King's main economic guru. It is a comparative misfortune that Canadian cities have not yet been leveled by the war. But it was his promise that Canadians will do so themselves as soon as the war is over. And everything was geared to meet that objective. The Income Tax Act was amended in 1940, in 1944, and most definitively in 1949. And 70 years later, we're living with the same garbage. So my first proposition to you is keep this high level. What should be happening here is not that we get into the weeds, not that we get into the algebra, not that we get into the incentive debate because that, I su suggest to you, is a dead end. What we should be doing is saying, look, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in 70 years, isn't it time that we rebalanced the system or at least rethought the system? We haven't done a major rethink of Canada's largest industry, which is construction, and the largest component of Canada's largest industry, which is renovation. 
in 70 years. That's my point. That's great, Mark. And uh, now we, we should we should jump on. But I think your point about pointing to the unfairness rather than to the incentive is a, is, a, is a brilliant, brilliant way to handle it, because I think that strikes a nerve with the public and with uh, policymakers for sure. Uh, Heather George has had her hand up. And sir, I missed this. Um, Heather, did you want to did you have something you wanted to, can, to throw on the table as well? Sir, I actually just put my ha hand down because I hadn't done enough background reading. So now I'm reading your other reports just to understand where things are at in terms of Indigenous concerns. Um, but I did just want to caution folks, and maybe you've heard this in other instances as well, but um, while this will be an important matter in terms of this election for our sites and organizations, um, uh, don't don't just run out and knock on the door of every Indigenous person you know, right? Um, so so just slow and cautious in this approach. I think I'm really glad to see it on the list, and I'll be reading through your reports more closely. Uh, I certainly am on the board of a National Historic Site, and so uh, you know we, which is on reserve, um, and we uh, always happy to have lots of support, but just you know. Be cautious. <laughs> that was it. But now I'm going to go read all of your documents. <laughs> no, and that's a great point, Heather. And, I, and, and yes, no, of course. And I wish you could have had Cody Grote, who's the president of the Indigenous Heritage Circle, uh, with us today. Um, they have really sort of pushed forward that whole um, uh, ask for you know capacity building support for for the Indigenous community around being able to respond to and uh, manage kind of cultural heritage in Canada. So it's unfortunate that he and, or, or another member of the board there couldn't be there today, uh, with us today. But um, no, no, we would wanna go um, go and, uh, and consult and connect uh, and have that uh, have that involved as well. Um, did Nora read, or did somebody did somebody else have their hands up? Is Kirsten, Nora had some comments about, about affordable housing. Is there somebody else that we should be going to here? Chris? Yes, go ahead, Gil, while we're waiting for Nora. Uh, just to get back to Heather's point, I think this is, personally, this is very important because I feel like I'm stumbling around in the dark on Indigenous issues, and I just, I just don't want to screw things up by saying the wrong thing. So, you know, if, if we are ever saying the wrong thing, like, shoot it down, because, you know, I, I was trained in journalism, and I learned that you know, you better have it straight. You better get your scolding inside the newsroom rather than having it go out on the news media wrong. So I appreciate your point. Nora, did you want to speak, not to put you on the spot, but did you want to speak to that affordable housing comment you made in the chat? I guess I am sort of putting you on the spot. But sure, you can you hear me? Further to say, yes. Yeah, hello. Um, yeah. Uh, this has been idea has been around for ages, but it's I'm talking about unfairness. It's unfair to leave the expense of keeping our heritage uh, alive and keeping it restored and keeping it uh, intact on the backs of individuals and businesses and uh, organizations. And uh, there's just been no, and we're talking about tax incentives. This is an old idea that's been around, but uh, the idea I put up was the um, work with the provincial governments to get uh, a separate property tax class for designated buildings and or designated areas or cultural heritage uh, properties uh, that would be at a lower tax rate. It would be very encouraging. Um, I work locally, obviously, all the time, and uh, it is really um, the complaints we hear from people who have a designated building is, uh, well, you know, what do we get to help us? Because we've got to keep all these features up. And uh, if they had a lower tax rate, uh, I think they would uh, feel like they got something back uh, for their contribution in preserving Canadian heritage. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great, those are great points, Nora, because I think it's, it's a matter of uh, going back to what Mark was saying about getting the tax, about the fairness across the board in terms of um, putting uh, repair uh, on a level playing field with the new construction. And part of that is about stimulating um, the labor, uh, the labor uh, that can actually sort of do re rehabilitation work at a cost effective level uh, on, 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 on the same level as uh, a new construction. So 
I think it's bound up and those are, those are really great points. Um, do we have a final comment? And I think we've got to actually wrap things up if, if we're going to be, uh, be beholden to our 20, uh, 115, our quarter past time slot. Oh, I think Dina wanted to say, did you have something Dina? Okay, jump in, please. Very quickly, I made some comments in the uh, in the chat box. Uh, I think you might want to share the the interview of the ch the new chair of the French Order of Architect with everyone. You know that might be a good uh, uh, freshen up course for the, for those who, uh, wanting to be bilingual Canadian. But mostly, what she says, she's a very young, talented architect. She pushes forward the unavoidability of going for no demolition development. You know, and that doesn't speak about heritage, but it speaks about the way to to understand what is developing in the 21st century. And I think it's, uh, if you want, I can send it to you. It's on, on the web and so on. It's a great uh, piece. But uh, what I would suggest is uh, that we are careful with uh, trying to use the, the um, uh, big topics and jump in. Somehow we have to be uh, able to identify ourselves with what we mean. Uh, the First Nation uh, issue is a top priority. It's not a matter that should be part of a program. It should be a program of the Canadian society, not any party. And somehow we have to see how we are solidaire with that, how we can contribute, but not to pretend that we are the spokesperson, because frankly, we should be uh, support, not uh, not uh, voice. And uh, the, uh, the same thing goes for housing and the environment. You know, the environment will benefit from our voice, but we will you know, the return on the investment is not so great when you think about it, because there's so big topic in the environment that it will be take, take a long time. But it would be good that we, uh, uh, you know, I was listening to uh, um, uh, Mark uh, uh, lecture. Why don't you turn this into a global mail uh, piece? And if you can't sign it, just invent a name, I, uh, you know, it's or take an, uh, an avatar. Uh, Mark, because frankly, this is worth knowing that we are using a tax system that goes back to the Canadian Middle Ages, somehow when it comes to this, and at its turn, time to come to the 21st century. So it would be just a piece on that, and we can follow up other groups. I think it's a, and a suggestion was to that we ask for a, a Canadian heritage impact assessment of the federal expenditures. You know, this is something that has made the the American movement, if you want. Uh, uh, a model article section 106 is essentially that and it would make a lot of sense uh, it, and it this is something which is not a plate of spaghetti that you try to handle with your hand uh, while you're juggling with jello it's something that can be very clear to say we want every dollar of the canadian dollar government not to be wasted on destroying our heritage whatever that heritage is is another matter but that could be a, a very positive uh, we did something with the ECOMAS Group Francophone, and it was observed that Canada was as uh, actually uh, uh, reduced or uh, uh, withdrawn its heritage impact uh, tools over the last few years. So to reinstate them would be very good. Thank you. And not just for our great point. For building. Great point, Dinu. And if you can send along that connect that uh, link to the uh, the, uh, the new chair of the Quebec uh, Architect Association, that would be great. And then I can it's share a, with the rest. Now, it's the French one. It's the French one. France, oh, La France. France. Yesterday was 14th of July. You know, think big. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Quebec. And just a point <laughs> that uh, I mean. Dino, uh, uh, Mark uh, did write a great article on that very point in the most in, in last month's uh, polished policy options magazine. There's a great month line okay. long series. Glo um, Globe and it, Mail. Globe and Mail, please. Globe and Mail. Yeah, it, it needs bigger. Everybody should be reading it. So uh, thanks, Mark, for that great piece. Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. And I guess, uh, uh, so Emily, could you throw up that uh, one of the second, that slide, what's next? And I think Rob, you wanted to speak to that really briefly. Um, yes, so th thank you everybody for participating today. Um, there's a lot, uh, there's lots of things to be discussed. What we in the next few weeks will have to do um, and with in partnership with our National Council partners, um, is try to put something together that not a policy, Don, uh, we heard you, uh, won't be a, a boring bureaucratic um, document, um, but we need to put that position out there because as Gil mentioned, it's not too late to influence the platforms. So if you, anybody on the line have your thoughts um, or suggestions or recommendations, please send them through to us. 
Um, tomorrow you will be receiving um, an email um, with a link to the recording of today's session. Um, and in that email, there will be an, uh, where the, the email address that you can send your thoughts to. So please, uh, your contributions will be really welcome. And if you're one of our National Council members, um, we will be sending something out as, as a draft to you very shortly um, in hopes that, yes, we are gonna influence the, pol uh, the platforms, but then once the election is called and as once uh, things are a little bit more, become a little bit more clear in terms of the party platforms, we will most likely uh, put together again some uh, questions both at the national party level um, so we at the National Trust would send them to the national parties for response and and then also then encouraging you all um, through those questions or versions of those questions to be asking them at the, at the local level because as Gil said our questions have to be clear consistent and constant uh, so keep ham we have to all keep hammering the, the same points in order to get a bit of traction so that's what we are aiming for I think collectively over the next uh, the next month, but then over the next couple of months as this election uh, takes place. So I think with that, we're just at 1.15 right now. And uh, any other questions, uh, comments, Chris, Kirsten? I think we're I think we're good. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, maybe Emily can pass it along. And I really thank everyone. Um, yeah. She can go to the next slides. Uh, thank everyone. I think this is a rich vein to explore. And I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more of it over the next month in the lead up to what is uh, sounds like the writ being dropped in the election in mid mid August, so a fertile time. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone to, to look at, um, take advantage of some of the uh, materials on our Regeneration Works uh, website. Uh, next one, Emily, and also to uh, think about becoming a member of the National Trust. We have a discount for new members uh, to try to uh, bring you into the fold and have you a par uh, part of a, a wider conversation. So thanks so much, everyone, for your thoughts today and looking forward to the conversation over the weeks and months ahead as things get very interesting this summer and into the early fall. Thanks so much again, everyone. And to you, Gil, thank you very much for contributing on our panel today. Yes. Take care.